Okay, so you made a decision at that point. Okay, I got this thing called a blog. Mm-hmm. I need to I need to start writing about this because you did. So I'm mm-hmm. assuming you're you're an intelligent person. You you decided this is the way that I'm going to start answering some of these questions. And I guess that's where all of this this problem started. Um, and I have the date, September 2018. <clears throat> Bishop Nestout ordered removal of a post from your blog, and you complied. So you wrote something on that blog. Was it specifically about the McCarrick case? Uh, it was about the McCarrick case, the effect of the McCarrick case and the Pennsylvania Grand Jury Report put together. The okay. effect on the morale of the Catholic people uh, at the time, uh, which was, I think, say to say, uh, you know, very widespread disillusionment with the okay. with the um, hierarchy, um, and so so it was an open letter to the Pope begging him to ask for the resignation of all the cardinals, hold a lottery to elect cardinals from among parish priests at random, and then uh, go ahead and and resign himself so that we could have a total fresh start um, of leadership. And okay. I mean. It, I, I didn't really think it was going to reach his ears. It was more of a kind of a creed occur on my part. It was it was very widely creed cre- uh, occur. Is that yeah. Latin? Yeah, uh, French. Yeah. Okay. So find that one for me. A, a, a soul, a in my audience, because nobody's going to know creed occur. A soul in pain crying out. Oh, okay. Out I, got you. It, it, the, I got and you. It, and it certainly resonated that way with a lot of people that that in my parishes and that had picked up reading my blog. Um, I, I had written, another thing I should mention is I'd written an open letter to Theodore McCarrick at the end of July of 2018 that, that was a little bit viral. It got a lot of uh, okay. circulation on the internet, um, t- just telling him that he had no right to, to do what he did, uh, to, to confirm all the people he did, to ordain all the people that he did. I mean, things like that. Right. Just, um, so, so that this open letter to the Pope was kind of a follow up to that letter. Actually, it wasn't out of nowhere. It was this is right. what we want. and I was writing on behalf of parish priests. Like this is what we're going through. We have a total crisis of our people do not have any faith in the next letter level of leadership above us. And so, why don't you do this? You know, why don't you just everybody on that level of leadership go back to where we are, pick at random from among us candidates. Yeah. You go where you are, and let's let's start fresh. And that's right. that's the the letter that he made me remove. And how and how did the parishioners react to first reading those two blogs? And then did they know that you removed them? Did you put on the blog? I had to remove this post. Bishop Nestout asked me, and what was what was the reaction of the parishioners? Because unfortunately, by your by your desire to have this revealed you're also bringing your parishioners into the conversation. Exactly. How did, how did they react to that? Right. Yeah. I appreciate the question. And, and I really, I mean, not, not, not to give myself a whole lot of credit, but I did try to reach a point with the Bishop at that point where um, to spare the people, some of that a little bit. I mean, I quietly removed the post at his request in immediate compliance with what he had asked me to do. But I knew that that was a potentially explosive situation that could re- have a, a backfire on him among the people. That so, so I asked him to give me the reason that he was asking me to do that, in the right. hope that having the reason could that I, I could understand it, and that I could then express his reason in such a way that other people could understand it, and and we could be. It, it didn't have to be. Uh, you know, adversarial situation. Right. Um, right. And, and you needed, uh, you know, not to put words in your mouth, but you needed to have information about what he thought was acceptable and unacceptable on the blog related to the scandals that the church was, was uh, walking into or had already experienced. So, I mean, I I would have asked the same thing, you know, what can I put on the, what can I put on the blog and what are the things that you're going to, you're going to disagree with. Let's have a dialogue and see whether we can come to some agreement. Is that was right. that what you were trying to do at that point? Yeah, exactly. I, I, I mean, you're giving me more credit than I deserve. I mean, you you, you just thought it through a little bit more carefully than I even than I did. But I but to, to have a, re, a reason, a clear reason for why I was 
being asked to remove his post seemed to me that step one towards a better place than where we are now, you know. Okay. Um, okay. So, um, so, so at that time, did you, did you stop the blog? When did you stop the blog in the fall of, or fall or winter of 2000 and, uh, um, no, I'm sorry. At 19, but 2018 was that the last communication you had with Bishop Nestout about your blog? Because somewhere uh, I, th I thought that you said it's been a year since I've heard anything about this. Exactly right. Yeah. He, so we had that interaction. We did not come to a good mutual understanding. Okay. I mean, and I propose that we have an annual get together of uh, priests with the bishop for a, like a three-day kind of retreat meeting. Okay every right. October. And I proposed to him that we could meet then and try to talk this whole thing over. Uh, but I never got an answer to that. And that, that, that whole occasion came and went without any further conversation between right. he and I. I mean, we were civil to each other at the, at the, at that meeting. And, uh, Father Mark, we're going to jump to, uh, November 21st of 2019. And my understanding is that, that you and Bishop Nestout really didn't have any substantive conversations about your blog or what you could what you could talk about and what you shouldn't be talking about in his opinion uh between the end of september and and uh november of the next year that that mm -hmm. there was no other substantive conversations about what you could do and what you couldn't do is that correct that's correct mm -hmm. okay all right so then then on november 21st uh the bishop just kind of shows up in rocky mount mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I guess at the end of one of your masses says, I need to talk to you, Mark, for 15 mm -hmm. minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay, what was the what was the substance of that conversation? Uh, we sat down in my office and he proceeded to read parts of a document to me that he referred to as, as being a decree. Um, I, and I can't remember everything that he wrote. The, he read the end of it first and the end of it stipulated that I would no longer publish anything on my web blog, that my web blog would no longer be on the internet in any way, that I wouldn't publish any of my opinions about anything by any social media effective immediately. Okay, so he basically said uh, w the, the blog is done. If you, mm -hmm. wanna, if you wanna keep doing what you're doing, the blog is done. Do you, know, do you know what got him to the point where he got in the car from Richmond and drove to Rocky Mount to give you that 15 minute meeting? Did you say something on your blog that was, that was uh, personally offensive to him or anything? Did he tell you why he was there and what prompted his drive for three hours from, probably more than three hours from Richmond right. to the Rocky Mountain? Yeah, it's three and a half. Uh, I mean, I, 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 he, I guess when I had inquired about what he wanted to meet with me about prior to committing to coming, I, I don't think that he took that well. I think that's part of it. Uh, and I don't think he took well and uh, what I had blogged about the bishop's visit to Rome, the American bishops were in the middle of their uh, every five year visits to Rome at the time. Uh, and and I regret to some extent the way that I expressed myself in anger in one of my posts. And I did apologize in a subsequent post for that because I was, I was extremely angry at the spectacle of the American bishops really, uh, for, forgive me for putting it this way, but kind of fan, fanboying the Pope. I mean, wanting to have selfies taken with the Pope and put it on their Twitter feeds without any engagement whatsoever of, of, the, of the problem of the still outstanding McCarrick report and not a word about it uh, right. with him. Uh, that just really made me angry. Uh, and so I, I did express myself in anger in a way that I shouldn't have. And I, and I, I owed my readership an apology and I did apologize for it. Uh, that might've had something to do with with his uh, coming, uh, okay. that, he did, that that did bother him, that I was had been so angry about that. Okay, but it sounds like if it was, was it indeed a 15 minute meeting? No, it was, it was closer to 40 it was okay. when all, everything was said and done. Did you guys have any any kind of back and forth or understanding about about anything that you wrote and why it was offensive? I mean, did you did you know at this time what what the bishop was upset with you about? Uh, or... Yes, enough. I mean, he the uh, he read from this document, which I, as I recall, was about two and a half pages. I never got a full on frontal look at the document, 
I, I'm not sure he read every word of it. Um, he did refer to at least one post, I think more than one, um, it, though I couldn't be sure because it was all coming at me pretty fast. Right. And he, 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 he misinterpreted something that I, I had written that was, that was clear to me as I was listening to him read. I, I, the whole time he was reading to me, I had in my mind, when he's done reading this to me, he's going to hand it to me. And I'm going right. to have a chance to go over it a little more carefully and understand what he's saying a little right. bit better and uh, react to it in a, in a way that would make sense because it's, it's, was not, I was not getting every word of it by any means. Right. Uh, so then when, when he didn't do that, um, when he then said, you will not receive, it, 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 I was presented, the vicar general was there also. He presented me with a piece of paper to sign affirming that I had heard the document read to me. And again, I, I, I had, a, I assumed that I was going to be handed the copy as right. soon as I saw right. that document. Right. So I wouldn't have signed it otherwise. Uh, but as soon as, as he, the bishop, as soon as I had signed that document, then the bishop says, you're not going to receive a copy of this. Uh, and I was stunned. That stunned me. Um, yeah, I, I come from a corporate world and, and it would shock. I, I don't know. I, I couldn't even imagine having somebody sign something that says, I heard this because normally you're, you're read it or they give you time to read it like a contract, you mm -hmm. know, with, with some kind of, uh, expert next to you that says, okay, here's what this word means. Before you sign it, you have a complete understanding of what you're signing. But is that, do you know if that's, is, is that part of the, of the, the way that the Catholic church does that? Because it, it sounds very, I, I don't know how you could ever process that. Exactly. Okay? Right. And, and would, when you signed it and then he said, then he said, you don't get a copy of this. I would have thought, well, damn, why did I sign that thing? Right. Yeah. And that is what I thought. I mean, because I, though I, I was so taken aback at that, that whole approach, because it is, I would say, totally foreign to the way that the canon law would stipulate that the church should operate. I mean, there is a provision, provision in canon law for delivering precepts, decrees orally when there's a grave reason to do so. But I consulted with a, a couple of canon lawyers just shortly after that, and none of them had any thought as to what the reason in this case would be. I, I mean, uh, apparently the bishop objects to any of his documents being published. I mean, and I had published one of his letters on my blog. He apparently objected to that. Right. Um, so, and he sub subsequently asked you not to publish some letters. Right. Lay, lay later in the spring. Am I right on that? That, That's that right. eventually right. he said, he said, don't publish any more of my letters. And you complied right. with that. You, That's right. you, you right. stopped, you stopped. Uh, okay. So, so the whole, the whole idea of the verbal thing, um, I guess I bring it back to a corporate, a corporate situation. Well, I was in human resources. If I had to, if I had to correct somebody about a disciplinarian situation, I would do it verbally, but then I would write it down. Mm -hmm. And then I would have them sign the written document that says, mm -hmm. you know, you've been told about this. Here's what the specifics are. You've signed and you've read it and you understand it and don't do it ever again. But it doesn't sound like that's the way that that, that was presented to you. Exactly. That's another point that these canon lawyers made to me when I asked them about this, that the whole idea of it was that I was supposed to be complying with a directive. And how, it, it's a little unreasonable to, to expect somebody to comply with a directive that they're read in a tense situation right. and then not given a copy of. Right. Um, it's kind of the opposite of, what, of how you're going to effectively direct somebody if right. you really want them to comply with what you want them to comply with. Okay. Now, my understanding is also you could have went to the diocesan office, pulled that document, but mm -hmm. you could have only read it. You couldn't have taken a picture with your phone. Or and the first thing I thought of, do they take your phone away when you're looking at your own personnel file? I guess uh, they because do, we right? never we never did that at Allstate. I mean, if you wanted right. to see whatever was in your personnel file, that was yours, and mm -hmm. you could see it. Whether you lost right. a, an evaluation or something, you wanted to go and you could take copies of everything because it's your document. It's not. Right. It wasn't. It wasn't Allstate's, but it doesn't right. sound like that works uh, in the Richmond diocese. Correct. Yeah. And unfortunately, I think that is a general practice in the diocese, at least in the United States, where the priests have these files that, 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 the, that the bishop regards not as the priest, but as his. 
and controls that, even our own access to our own files. Uh, right. Okay. That's yeah. interesting. Troubling and interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. So so later later in December, you write to the bishop to ask him to reconsider, uh, and then you're you're set up for a February meeting. That you're going to mm -hmm. go to a February meeting. Um, and at this point, are you still blogging at this point, or you have shut down the blog? I shut it down. I, I, he he left my office with the instruction that I did. I did. It did. I did get it. You know, you will. Your blog. Yeah, will be shut that's down. what he that's said first. Right? He, said, he said your blog is dead, right, right at the right at the top. So you understood right. that part. Right. So I complied immediately. He walked out, and I, that's the first thing I did was was remove my blog. From, I couldn't completely comply because there's no way to get out into the internet and remove every vestige of everything you've ever published. That's actually right, possible. Right. But as far as anybody having access to my blog, right. I, I was able to render that impossible, which is what I did. 